Jesus Walks is the name of our sermon series throughout this season of Lent. We're going to be doing the same series on the weekends as we're doing on Wednesdays, so you don't want to miss any of these services. And I can't think of a better sermon series to invite someone into. Isn't it wonderful to have new members join us today? Jesus wants more, amen? And this is a great time to invite people in your life that you know who need Jesus to come because we're just going to be telling the stories. We're going to be going on a journey with Jesus. From the time that he first stepped onto the pages of history as an adult until the time he was crucified and ultimately rose again as we celebrate this Easter We're going to look at some of the most significant uh, encounters and teachings in his life. We're going to watch as he shows the world that he was the greatest teacher who ever lived. And that his life was more than that. That he was the ultimate sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. And that was a brand new concept 2,000 years ago. Nobody had ever entered into the world and said, I will pay for the sins of everyone. And to be honest, it's still a difficult concept for the world to grasp and to comprehend and believe. It's even harder, it's even hard for believers to believe it, amen? God help our unbelief. But when you read the Bible, it could not be clearer that Jesus came into the world to do something new. He did not come to extend what was old. He didn't come to, to finish the Bible so that we could have a nice, neat Old Testament and New Testament. He came to do something to the world and for the world that the world had never seen before. And this new thing is what we're going to discuss today. Now, I'm so grateful that Pastor Bill was was here to lead us in worship so far because every headliner needs an opening act, amen? Someone to kind of get out there and stir up the crowd and get everybody excited. And Jesus was no exception. And so, from the Jordan River Basin, draped in animal skin, smelling of the locust that he ate for lunch, John the Baptist steps onto the pages of history. He is literally the opening act for Jesus. Now you've heard of John the Baptist. and The reason he was called John the Baptist wasn't because he, he wasn't John the Methodist or John the Lutheran or John the Episcopalian. He was called the Baptist Because as far as we can tell in human history, John was the very first person who ever manhandled another person and baptized them. Before John started baptizing, baptism was part of a multifaceted process where a non-Jewish person would become a Jewish person. There was a meal and you had to read some books and do a whole lot of learning. And then as a sign that you were becoming part of an Old Testament Jewish covenant, you would be baptized. But somebody else wouldn't baptize you. It was more like a ceremonial washing that you would do yourself. Nobody else would even touch you. And then John came to the Jordan River. And he starts full contact dunking people in the water. So they call him the Baptist, or John the Baptizer. There are four first-hand accounts of the life of Jesus. We call these the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. Now Luke opens his account by saying this. He said, I have thoroughly investigated all the things I'm about to write about, and I have put them in chronological order for you. 
So, of course, Luke begins with the birth of Jesus because it's chronological. But then in chapter 3, Luke introduces us to Jesus' opening act, John the Baptist. And here's how he makes the introduction. Luke says, In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip was tetrarch of Ituria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias was tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. Now, if you've ever read the Bible before, you get to these parts and you go, whatever, right? Let's get to the good stuff. But Luke's introduction of John is actually extraordinary. Luke is saying to the skeptics of his day and to the skeptics of our day, fact check me. I dare you. In other words, he's not saying this is something that happened a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. He's not saying, well, here's a good story. It doesn't really matter if it's true because it's such a good story. He is saying, what I'm about to tell you is history. This is why he gives such meticulous detail. Luke is a historian's dream. And he starts with the big picture. He said, here's the emperor of Rome, and then the governors of Judea and Galilee, and the sub-governors, all the way down to who the high priest was of the time. What he's saying is, do I have your attention? Is everybody on the same page with me? And the people of his day would have nodded their heads and said, yeah, we remember when those guys were in charge. We remember what those days were like and what was happening. And even historians today who don't take Jesus seriously think that this is some amazing stuff that an ancient writer would, would put something so specific in his work. And it's only after he fact-checks everybody that Luke says, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. People came to him from Jerusalem and Judea and all around the Jordan Valley. Thousands of people are going to basically the middle of nowhere. And it's not an easy trip. If you're from Jerusalem, you got to wake up before the sun rises in the morning. You got to walk all day. You're not going to get there until after the sun has gone down. You're going to have to camp out. And then wake up the next morning and hope you can find John wherever he is along the river. This is not a convenient trip. But on the banks of the Jordan River, John the Baptist begins to preach. And thousands upon thousands begin to listen. And this is the problem. Because every once in a while in those days, Somebody would stand up and say, hey, I'm the Messiah. And they'd get a little bit of a following. And then people would start talking about overthrowing Rome. And Rome would find out about it. And they'd come in and they'd start killing a whole bunch of people. And so, thanks to King Herod and his sons, things had been pretty quiet. And Rome had been pretty happy. And, and things were going well. But suddenly, on the banks of the Jordan, there's a guy who's saying all kinds of strange things. And he's stirring up thousands of people who aren't just listening to him. They actually start to confess their sins at the Jordan River, which really gets the priests upset. You see, the Jewish people in the first century had a very sophisticated system of confessing their sins. There was a way that you were supposed to do it. There was an order to it. We might call it a liturgy. It's my liturgy joke. Come on. You'd have to go to the temple. You bought a sacrifice, depending on how bad you screwed up, depending on how big your sacrifice was. And then you said certain words to the priest or the high priest or the not-so-high priest assistant. Point is, 
You found somebody who was in charge and you did the right things. Somebody who had some authority so that when you confess to them, then they would tell you what you needed to do in order to get forgiveness. It's like many religious systems that we still have today. So here's a nobody in the middle of nowhere. And these Jewish people who had been taught the right way of doing things start going to him and confessing their sins. He's acting like a walking, talking temple. He's hearing confessions. He's forgiving people. He's baptizing people with his own two hands and with no permission from anybody. Who does this guy think he is? No education. Nobody backing him up. And no explanations. Just some wild-eyed, crazy preacher in the middle of nowhere making claims. And the whole nation is flocking to him. Another one of the Gospels, written by a guy named John, who was not John the Baptist, said, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Who is John the Baptist? He came as a witness to testify concerning the light, so that through him everyone might believe. And this is what Gospel writer John said, Baptist John testified about Jesus. And hang on for a minute because this gets a little weird. He said, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. What? Gonna have to back up a little bit here, John. I'm just telling you, I got here first, but he got here before I got here. And you haven't seen him yet. But when he shows up, Oh my goodness, y'all better get ready. And then gospel writer John describes this huge tension that all of those Jewish people were feeling in the first century. He writes, for the law was given through Moses. And to a first century Jew, the law was everything. Moses was the law giver. Now, modern rabbis in those days, they could comment on the law of Moses, but they could never add to the law. You could talk about it, but you did not mess with it. And the Jewish law governed every facet of first century Jewish life. People would die for the Torah, the law. People would die for the sacrificial system and the temple that it set up. And then John comes along and he says, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And this was a contrast. This was something new in the works. John's testimony, John the Baptist's testimony about Jesus was the beginning of a whole new reality. And it freaked the religious people out. So they sent some priests and some Levites to John the Baptist to ask him who he was. So John's out there preaching and he finishes up his sermon and he baptizes a few people in the river and he climbs out of the water and he sees these guys in their black robes and their fancy tassels coming towards him. And he knows what they want to ask. They want to know, who are you? And by whose authority are you doing these things and preaching these sermons? Are you another wannabe Messiah? Because if you are, we're going to have to take you back to Jerusalem and ask you a few questions. So John knows what they've come to ask him. But before they even get a chance to ask their questions, he gives them this answer. He says, no, I'm not the Messiah. So then they ask, then who are you? Are you Elijah? And the reason they ask, are you Elijah, is because the last book of the Old Testament is Malachi. 
And Malachi was the last prophet that Israel had heard from for 400 years. Between Malachi and John the Baptist, God was silent towards his people for four centuries. But in Malachi, the prophet said, See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. And so they ask, Well, if you're not the Messiah, are you the prophet Elijah who was supposed to come before the Messiah? And John says, I'm not. Then they ask about the prophet. They say, are you the prophet? And they ask about the prophet because Moses and the Qumran community had taught that there would be a great prophet who would come and let people know that God was about to do the next big thing. But he answers, not him either. So finally they say, well, enough of these dumb questions then. you got to tell us who you are. Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? I mean, we can't go back home and say, well, we know who he's not. We got to know who you are. We got to know in whose authority you're doing these things. And come on, man. You got to stop letting people confess their sins down by the river. You got to go up the hill. You got to go up to the altar in Jerusalem. You're out here acting like a portable temple. What's up with that? Who do you think you are? And John answers them by quoting the prophet Isaiah. He says, I'm the voice, the voice of one calling in the wilderness, make straight the path for the Lord. I'm just the voice. Nobody special, not that smart. Obviously, I'm not very put together. I'm not important. I'm just the voice. And I'm out here in the wilderness because this is where God told me to be. Not on a hill, not at the temple, not in the big city. He said the wilderness. And so here I am. He told me to come here and tell you to get ready. Everybody get ready. Because God's about to do his next big thing. I'm just the warm-up act. I'm just here to gather people and prepare them for what God is about to do. I baptize with water, but among you stands one you don't even know. You think I'm a big deal? I'm just the voice. You think I've drawn a big crowd? You think I've unsettled things? You think I make you nervous and your boss is nervous? And pilot nervous. Man, you don't even know. You ain't seen nothing yet. He is the one who comes after me. The straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. The one who's coming, he's the main act. I might look like somebody. I mean, there's a pretty big crowd going on right here. But I'm telling you. Compared to who's coming next, I'm nobody. Not the answer they wanted to hear. So they go back to Jerusalem and they're like, well, okay, I guess we know who he's not. We're not sure who he is. And he did quote a bunch of scripture at us. So the high priest and his guys decide that they're going to have to go themselves and talk to John the Baptist. So they get up early and they go. And they probably go with a caravan and an entourage. And these guys are perfect. I mean, they smell good. They look good. They dress good. They, they're better than everybody else around them. If God was going to do something new, then these guys would be the first to know about it. And when they arrive, John's out there doing his thing, baptizing and teaching and confessing. And he looks up and he notices them in all of their religious glory. And there's John with his disheveled hair and his beard all matted up and whatever animal skins he threw on that morning. And here comes the most sophisticated 
buttoned up and oily haired people in the nation. But before they can even get close enough to ask John a question, he looks them up and down and he says, you brood of vipers. And a hush fell over the crowd. Nobody talks to these guys like that. These are the holiest of the holy people that we've got. I mean, these guys' full-time job is to just be better than you and me. And John says, you brood of vipers. Who warns you to flee from the coming wrath? Who warned you? Now, everyone else was coming because they felt convicted and they wanted to repent and they wanted to be baptized. And maybe some of them felt that these holy guys were coming to repent and be baptized. But John knew better, which is why he went on to say this. He told them to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Now there's a dig. Have you ever tried to convince a proud person that they need to repent of their sin? It doesn't always go well. So the crowd is murmuring. And John the Baptist is telling the holiest men in the country that they need to repent of their sins. And he's saying, and don't tell me that you did that in private back in Jerusalem or you said some magic prayers that are suddenly going to bless you. I want to see some fruit. I want to see some change in how you live your life because you're truly sorry for your sins. These are the law keepers. And John is telling them, you are the law breakers because I can see what's going on the inside. And that's the friction that will be a part of the ministry of Jesus for the rest of his days. It starts with John the Baptist giving the religious people a heads up that the days of compassionless loophole religion are coming to an end. All of that is coming to an end. Prepare yourselves for the wrath of God, you lovers of religious traditions and the rules of men designed to make you look and feel good. Turns out it was a pretty short conversation because they had nothing to say to John. They just turned around, caravan and all, and then went back to Jerusalem. And then it happened. The moment that the whole nation had been waiting for. The moment that all creation had been groaning for. The next day, after the religious leaders had gone home, John saw Jesus coming towards him. No caravan. No entourage, no holier-than-thou attitude, just Jesus. And this is the first time that we see him in the Bible for 18 years. Last time we saw him, he was a 12-year-old in Jerusalem. Now let's just pause here for this moment and imagine. In this moment in time, John, or Jesus knows who Jesus is. And John knows who Jesus is. And they're the only ones. And John sees Jesus. And Jesus sees John. And the greatest transition in human history is about to take place. You see, during this encounter, Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, steps into history as an adult. God in body, for the first and probably only time, is about to go public. And things would never be the same. This world would never be the same. And whether you believe in Jesus or not, that truth is undeniable. 
The world will never fit back into the box that it used to fit in before God the Father revealed that this was his one and only son and that he loved him and that you and me and everyone in the world and everyone who wants to live forever needs to listen to his voice. And all eyes are on John. And he breaks the spell of that moment. A moment pregnant with every hope that has ever filled a human heart. And he says, and I love this, look, the Lamb of God. He doesn't say believe. He doesn't say, imagine. He doesn't say, well, let's pretend. He doesn't say, you got to check your brain at the door. He says, look, it's the lamb. John invites all the people standing on Jordan's banks, and he invites you, and he invites me to look and behold the lamb of God. And every single one, of those good Jewish people gathered around the Jordan, remembered the story of Abraham when he was about to sacrifice his one and only son. And God showed up at the very last moment, and he provided the lamb. And John says, look, the lamb that comes from God the lamb which God himself provides, who takes away the sin of the world. Far away from the holy city and those holy people and that holy temple, God is meeting the world outside in the wilderness of our sin, and he provides a lamb to lift our sin from us that we might be spared. Now, of course, those good Jewish people could barely wrap their minds around the fact that their sins were being forgiven away from the temple. But then John says that God is providing not just for them, but for the sins of the whole world. And they say, hold on a minute, John. Even non-Jewish sins. Even the sins of our enemies. And what about the sins of those Romans? Hold on, John. Our entire history is marked by struggle against foreign gods and foreign nations. And pretty much any foreigner we meet, we just assume God doesn't like them very much. We're waiting for a Messiah like General Joshua who will come and expel the enemy and let the world know that God is for us and he's against everybody else. And you're trying to tell us that God has provided a lamb to take away the sins of the whole world, including everyone? And this was the tension that created the conflict for the rest of the earthly ministry of Jesus. You see, Jesus is the bridge between two covenants, the bridge between two radically different worldviews. Jesus fulfills the old covenant by keeping the law perfectly, and then he goes and cuts a new covenant with everyone in the world through his own blood. And this new covenant is a covenant of grace, built not on what you do, but on what God has done for you. The first covenant between God and the nation was instituted at Mount Sinai, when God brought Moses up and gave him the Ten Commandments and the 600 plus other commands, and told him this is how the nation is supposed to operate, and this will prepare them for what I am ultimately going to do. Because ultimately, I will establish a new covenant, not with one nation, but with every nation. 
And the law did prepare them. It shows everyone who has ever tried to keep it just how broken and sinful we are. And if we don't allow ourselves to be blinded like those religious leaders, it prepares us to repent of our sin and receive something new and infinitely better. It prepares us for grace. But transitions are hard, amen? They're stressful. Old ways die hard. And those who profit from the status quo are the least inclined to let it go. God is the one who established the sacrificial system, trying to let Israel know that they're not alone, that he's providing for them. But when Jesus shows up, the temple system was broken beyond repair. He had nothing good to say about it. In fact, this very system would ultimately join forces with the kingdoms of this world and crucify him. But his death was just another transition. What was designed to be his ultimate end was only the beginning of something new and unbelievably beautiful. A new covenant. A new arrangement between you and God made possible by grace through faith in what Jesus has done for you, not in what you have to do for God. What happened on the banks of the Jordan River was a new beginning. As Jesus made his way down to the waters, he says, John, my friend, baptize me. And John's like, are you kidding? I just told all these people, I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie your sand. I am not going to baptize you. But Jesus smiled and he put his hand on John's shoulder and he said, John, you must do this. You must anoint me as the sacrificial lamb for the sins of the whole world so that this world can see something they've never seen before. I am going to fulfill all righteousness and make everything and everyone right that has gone so terribly wrong. And so John baptized. And that's how our story begins this Lent. God's promise to Abraham would be fulfilled through a man who came as a lamb to take away the sin of the world, your sin and my sin. And we've got a lot more stories to tell, a lot more sermons to preach. We've got diseases to heal and crowds to feed and tables to turn over as we spend the next 40 days looking at what happens when Jesus walks among us. Amen. Wednesday, please come back and join us as we continue this series, as we watch Jesus melt our hearts at how much he loves the outcast. Pastor Bill is going to deliver a dynamite message on the Samaritan woman, so please come back and join us for that. Everybody stand up. Put your hand on somebody. 